backwards, I suppose we'll just have to catch up. Everybody can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, for those of you that I haven't had a face-to-face -face interaction with, I'm Sergeant Dan Cotter. I've been with the Department of Public Safety for about two and a half, three years now. Uh, over here is Detective Sergeant Joe Tirabashi, and over in the corner, Officer Dylan Sullivan. Uh, first and foremost, we want to thank the uh, administration of the college, as well as our administration and department, uh, Chief Karen Leary, uh, for allowing us to get the subject matter uh, out into the public view a little bit more. Uh, we've been doing this presentation for about two years now across campus uh, by request only. Uh, and then uh, as the fall hit this year, we had a higher demand of people that wanted to uh, be a part of uh, our active shooter training to know what we were doing on campus to prepare for an active shooter event. So this is the first time we've had an open forum presentation and I appreciate all of your time. Uh, we slotted an hour and a half today presentation normally runs about 45 minutes to an hour, question depending, so the back end will really be open to uh, any unanswered questions that you folks have as far as the subject matter. So to get started, um, we don't bill it specifically as an active shooter or active killing presentation, because really uh, by the time we end today, I, I really want to hammer home emergency preparedness as a whole. Statistically speaking, uh, there's a, tons of different disasters that we can be faced with throughout our lives and even our careers here on campus. We can refer back to the tornado a few years back for those of you that were a part of that here. Uh, power outages just the other day. Uh, I was out in Wilbraham. You take for granted these resources that we have on a daily basis, and uh, when they disappear, you really uh, realize how unprepared we really can be for things that can strike at a moment's notice. So the different types of disasters um, that we hope to have you thinking about by the end of this presentation. We have natural disasters. A lot of times we have a, a higher amount of warning for things like this. Severe weather events, snowstorms, hurricanes. Uh, tornadoes obviously can pop up uh, relatively quickly. Earthquakes, floods, volcanoes. So those are our natural disasters. Uh, technological disasters, chemical releases, spills, power outages, natural gas explosions, things like that. Uh, car accidents down power lines, emergency preparedness, and having that uh, cerebral element to be able to think about what happens if uh, falls in those technological. And then we have the man-made disasters. These are our terrorist attacks, riots, mass shootings, and obviously mass shootings, active killer, active shooter events will be the top billing for today's presentation. So first we have to say, we have to define what an active shooter or an active killer is, okay? Um, some people refer to it always as an active shooter, but we're already kind of pigeonholing ourselves right off the rip if we say an active shooter event, because these things can come in all shapes and sizes. Active killer events can happen with a knife. I believe it was the tail end of last year, around Christmas time, uh, an individual hijacked a Home Depot truck and plowed it onto a bicycle path out in New York City. So being able to wrap your mind around the fact that we're not always going to be in an active shooter event, but your life could still be in danger, okay? And so an active shooter or an active killer is an individual actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a confined or populated area. The event is usually over within 10 minutes. Now, if you jump online, you'll see it sometimes seven minutes, sometimes as much as 14 minutes. Uh, but oftentimes it's before law enforcement can respond and it'll go until there's some sort of interjection, whether the individual takes their own life. Um, a lot of times, law enforcement will come to these events lights and sirens because just knowing that law enforcement is on the way is enough to stop the attack. And then there could be some other interjection from somebody who's involved in the attack, possibly a victim, that could stop it. So when we get into the goal and mindset of the attacker, the desire of the attacker is to kill or seriously injure without concern for his or her safety or threat of capture. There's normally intended victims and they will seek them out, but they accept targets of opportunity while searching for and after finding their intended victims. And they will continue to move throughout a building or area until stopped by law enforcement, suicide, or other intervention. So the purpose of this training today is that there's no actual profile of an actual shooter. Um, and we cannot predict uh, violence that's going to happen on a college campus. So we need to develop uh, an effective system to facilitate a uh, comprehensive approach to address individuals that require monitoring and care. Um, 
We need to train our facility and staff and students to effectively respond to all types of crisis situations that may occur in our respective campuses. So here on campus, we're already doing a lot of this. We have the students of concern that is available to us. It's a good resource to be able to put people on. We feel like requires some sort of additional monitoring for the, on their well-being that put, puts it on the radar of certain departments around here to make sure that people are getting the help that they need. Also, we have to hammer home that we cannot predict violence. A lot of times people will come up to us, especially you folks that are working in office settings and things like that, and say, can you come by and look at my office? What should I do if? That's really an impossible question. We can give you best practice on preparing yourself, but ultimately you know your environment, you know your daily routine better than we ever will. So it's difficult for us to say, well, I would always go down this stairwell if something were to happen. Because if you uh, pinhole yourself to only do it that way, then on, on the unfortunate circumstance that the attack or event comes from that stairwell, you walk right into uh, an even bigger problem. And if you do see someone on campus that is, you know, that is alarming to you or something that may, you know, you're concerned for their safety or the safety of others, um, we can all hear and we all can uh, do a student concern report. Um, and we have a group of people on a campus with the major departments on campus like student affairs, counseling, public safety, that we all meet and we discuss um, factors of, of, of this, uh, each individual case of a student or staff. So if you guys need, you know, if you guys, you know, want to reach out to us, we can explain a little bit more further, but uh, it's a good resource that we have on campus and, you know, we've helped a lot of people on campus with, you know, with these kind of programs. Okay, uh, take it from the FBI and Secret Service 10-year study of school shooters. There's a four-pronged assessment approach on people that might be uh, threats to commit these sort of acts of violence. Problem one, takes the personality of the student. Two, the family dynamics, what's going on at home. Three, the school dynamics, what's going on here, and their role in the school dynamics. And then four, the social dynamics. So what kind of relationships are they building uh, in their social setting? Are they a part of extracurricular activities, things like that? So I guess uh, by a show of hands, who thinks the Springfield College is prepared to deal with the sort of mass casualty or active shooter event? Okay, they go kind of up, kind of not up. That's, so the bottom line is the fact that we're even having this dialogue right now shows that we're actually ahead of where a lot of other institutions are. It's the fact that you folks have realized that it's time to have this conversation for a lot of years, especially in higher education. Uh, facilities, people didn't want to have these conversations. They're uncomfortable to have, but it's an unfortunate reality at this point that we've begun to really get in front of a lot of this training. So we have a couple videos throughout the course of uh, the presentation here. Uh, this one's a little bit on the lighter side. The second one has some simulated violence. I'll preface that before we go. There's no bloodshed or anything like that, but there are. it's put out by the Department of Homeland Security, and I'll give anybody the opportunity that doesn't really want to sit through that. It's about a five and a half minute video uh, to just step out into the hallway before we play it. Joe promised me that he would be all set over there on the button question. <laughs> this is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? This was a, an Australian uh, cyclist awareness video uh, that they put out some years ago. I know the footage is a little bit grainy, but you can pretty much get the premise of it. And I like that video I've used in this presentation since, since we began uh, because there's so many things that we get bogged down with, whether it's our, a lot of times it's cell phone related. You see uh, our student populace, I'm guilty of it. 
This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Joe, you promised. I know. I don't know how it happened, but... It's so easy for us to get distracted with our daily life. I know that, unfortunately, I'm even guilty of it behind the wheel of a car sometimes. My phone will ring or I'll be messing with the radio station. We have fender benders, we have things like that. So if we can't be responsible enough to sometimes pay attention when we're driving, then even when we're inside of our own comfort zone, our own environment, our office, or walking around on campus, a lot of times that situational awareness can drop as well. So kind of thinking outside of yourself a little bit, and making sure that you're picking up on things and not walking into imminent danger is really the, uh, the ultimate point of that video for this presentation. So if you do, uh, by an unfortunate, unfortunate circumstance, find yourself in any sort of, sort of an active killing or active shooting event, uh, it's important to realize that you have to start taking those combat breaths, okay? Because the first thing you'll do is you'll lose your fine motor skills and you'll put yourself in a, a less advantageous spot for survival. But the information that we're interested in getting relayed to us is the location of the active shooter, the number of shooters, if there are more than one, a physical description. So a lot of times uh, people will say that they see red or they freeze uh, in things that are important. Uh, you know, he's a six foot four white male wearing black over tan. And that's kind of the way that we're trained to see things, but he had a black shirt on, okay. You know, were, was there anything else that you noticed? A lot of times, especially if people aren't used to seeing firearms or weapons, they'll focus in on that one thing. So they miss a bigger picture of what, he, what the person is wearing, something like that. So it's really something you have to kind of train your mind to do to be able to take that step back in that horrible situation. The number and type of weapons held by the shooter. A lot of times we know that people that aren't gun people, I'm not really a gun person myself, aren't going to give you know, makes or models or anything like that of what they're dealing with, but, well, it sounded like a shotgun. There's a distinct sound to a racking of a shotgun, or it was a, a rifle platform, you know? Uh, the misconceptions of certain, you know, he, he had a handgun, you know that he had a handgun. Okay, so now we know what we're dealing with when we're arriving on scene. And then, unfortunately, if you, if you can get the information on the number of potential victims at a location as well, uh, these incidents, across the country always end up being a lot of misinformation that gets put out. The initial information is not always the right information. And unfortunately, we can sometimes be a victim of Twitter or these social media um, applications that are passing out, okay, I know there was more than one shooter, there was more than one, and it creates a lockdown where they're really cl clearing for hours on end looking for a phantom shooter that might not have even existed. And then to pass on that victim information because that's gonna be um, information that's pertinent for our follow line units, our emergency responders, fire, EMS, uh, ambulances, stuff like that. So before we get into this, this is a five and a half minute video from the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security. It's a great video with a ton of pertinent information in it, but it does have some simulated violence uh, right at the beginning. So I can take a minute and allow anybody that wants to step out of the room to do so. normally where my water break comes in too, but I, don't, I forgot my bottle of water, so. <clears throat> All right. It may feel like just another day at the office, but occasionally, life feels more like an action movie than reality. The authorities are working hard to protect you and to protect our public spaces. But sometimes, bad people do bad things. Their motivations are different. signs may vary, but the devastating effects are the same. And unfortunately, you need to be prepared for the worst. Ever 
find yourself in the middle of an active shooter event, your survival may depend on whether or not you have a plan. The plan doesn't have to be complicated. There are three things you could do that make a difference. Run, hide, fight. First and foremost, if you can get out, do. Always try and escape or evacuate, even when others insist on staying. Encourage others to leave with you, but don't let them slow you down with indecision. Remember what's important, you, not your stuff. Leave your belongings behind and try to find a way to get out safely. Trying to get yourself out of harm's way needs to be your number one priority. Once you're out of the line of fire, try to prevent others from walking into the danger zone and call 911. If you can't get out safely, you need to find a place to hide. Act quickly and quietly. Try to secure your hiding place the best you can. Turn out lights, and if possible, remember to lock doors. Silence your ringer and vibration mode on your cell phone. And if you can't find a safe room or closet, try to conceal yourself behind large objects that may protect you. Do your best to remain quiet and calm. As a last resort, if your life is at risk, whether you are alone or working together as a group, fight, act with aggression, improvise weapons, disarm, and commit to taking the shooter down, no matter what. Try to be aware of your environment. Always have an exit plan. Know that in an incident like this, victims are generally chosen randomly. The event is unpredictable and may evolve quickly. The first responders on the scene are not there to evacuate or tend to the injured. They are well trained and are there to stop the shooter. safety and survival. Be aware and be prepared. And if you find yourself facing an active shooter, there are three key things you need to remember to survive. Run, hide, fight. All right, so that run, hide, fight ideology is uh, started to adapt over time. You might see it as avoid, deny, defend as well. Um, the platform that we're training on in the Department of Public Safety is the alert platform. We did an interview probably around this time last year, I believe. Uh, it's advanced law enforcement rapid response training. And again, it's run, hide, fight training. Uh, I was able to become a uh, certified civilian response to active shooter event instructor, uh, which has really helped. Uh, especially a lot of the department is uh, going off to level one, level two training, as well as the exterior response to active shooter events. 
uh, training that so we have instructors on staff and we're really drilling this and hammering it home uh, behind the scenes. So that run high fight ideology has progressed over time. So I really like this quote and I threw it in here um, because this is really uh, the, the foundation to bring this presentation home. Uh, chaos, panic, and fear can only be minimized, never eliminated. It's preceded by preparation and plan. So Colonel John Boyd uh, developed the OODA loop for the military. Has anybody ever heard of the OODA loop before? So <clears throat> basically it stands for observe, orient, decide, act. So O-O-D-A. And this looks like I'm a lot more scientific than I actually am. But it's really taking information in, observing it, you're orienting to your surroundings. At that point you're making a decision that you're going to act and then ultimately acting upon your current situation based on uh, information that you're getting into your senses. So disaster personalities. This is a new addition to the presentation. For those of you that have seen it before, I added this. Knowing your disaster personality before an emergency situation can help you, give you a better chance at mitigating that situation. So you start to cycle through the human emotions of denial and then deliberation and then that decisive moment that says I have to act, whether I have to run, I have to hide, or I have to fight, I have to do something because if I stay here, uh, it's gonna minimize my chance of survival in any sort of emergency uh, situation. So I'm going through a book right now, and as I'm reading this book, it's talking about the folks that were trapped above the uh, plane entrance zone, the crash zone in Tower 1 on September 11th. There were folks that went up to the roof but for a period of time, the, there were three stairwells in Tower 1 that one of the stairwells was completely accessible going down. So because the action was to go to the roof, ultimately it cost uh, people their lives. So it's one of those things where knowing your environment, obviously here we're going to find ourselves in a 110-story skyscraper, but knowing where stairwells are, where exit doors are, that you may not pay attention to on a daily basis, but now you know, okay, this door I know is going to open outwards, or it's going to open inwards. What do I have to do if I have to barricade this door? Is there a lock? Is there a blocking mechanism on any sort of door or passageway? You have a window that's available to you. You have something that could break a pane of glass should you need to. Now, ultimately, you find these tools of convenience as well. A lot of people wouldn't think to use uh, their belts. So if you look up at some of the doors that open, they have the arms that open out. If you strap a belt on there, that door won't be able to open up outside or in. Uh, using a fax machine, door stoppers, things like that. So you start to find out, okay, if that door does get greased, I have a fire extinguisher, I have something that I can use as a, a weapon to, of my convenience. But human beings, as we cycle through denial, deliberation, and the decisive moment, ultimately this can cause us our lives as well. So if we spend an excessive amount of time in denial, well, it must be construction, because I'm hearing loud bangs in the room next to me, it must be construction. And Virginia Tech, there was a professor that kept going on, kept carrying on throughout the course of his lecture, and he had never heard this loud banging before, but the lecture hall, nobody moved, they thought nothing of it. They didn't think to go investigate the fact that there were gunshots going off a couple rooms down the, the, uh, the hallway. Deliberation, you can spend an excessive amount of time saying, you know what, uh, you know, it's hurricane preparation, I'm not gonna stay. I'm not gonna stay because every other hurricane we've ever been hit with, they've said that I should be worried about it, but you know what, the house has been fine, everything's been okay. Uh, then you get down to that stage where you spend too much time in deliberation and ultimately can end up costing you your life in that, that sense as well. And then there's that decisive moment. So the people that cycle through these three things, uh, denial, deliberation, the, the decisive moment, the quickest, ultimately have the best chance of survival in an emergency situation. So this is normally my hook on the presentation. I really like this line. And this is, if you leave with nothing else today, if you can just leave with this, it's important to remember that the body cannot go somewhere the mind has never been. So if the first time you're dealing with a situation, an emergency situation, is the first time you've ever thought about it, you're gonna have a, a higher propensity to freeze up, okay? So as we get down here, a threat to your life is a universal human phobia. The fear can, however, be an impediment to survival, okay? So fear causes a high heart rate, a loss of fine motor skills, a dump of endorphins. It spirals into acute stress disorder, 
otherwise what we know as fight, flight, or freeze. So this is why, especially us as police officers, we get stress inoculation in the police academy. Um, the screaming and yelling of drill instructors is supposed to make it so we know what it's like to be put in situations where there's going to be chaos around us. And it helps us cycle through denial, deliberation, that decisive moment a little bit quicker to make you know, the right decision. Fight, flight, or freeze. Freezing up can be an impediment to your survival if you're in an emergency situation. Okay? Not doing anything, not getting to that decisive moment, that decisive action, can cause you to be a, a casualty in an emergency situation. So your loss of fine motor skills, I don't know if, if anybody's ever been in an argument or in a car accident or something like that. And you know, if you get out roadside in a car accident, and your car's banged up and you might be injured, you might not feel the pain right away, but you have a hard time exchanging information, getting your license, getting your insurance information, reading or writing at that point. That's where you get the loss of those fine motor skills and stress that's dumping in. In a survival situation, what happens is your heart starts to pull all the blood to your center of your core. It's a survival mechanism. But when that happens, unfortunately, we lose a lot of those fine motor skills. Being able to unlock your phone, to make a 911 call, or being able to dial or open a door. So these are the things we need to start to think about before you actually have to do them in a stressful situation. Yeah. Uh, how to react when law enforcement does arrive. So law enforcement's purpose is to stop an active shooter as soon as possible. Officers will proceed directly to the area where the last shots were heard. Officers will arrive in teams of four. Again, this is resource dependent. Here we're always running at least two to three patrol officers, a supervisor, and then we have plainclothes officers as well that are working. So we have those four officers, but other agencies might not. They might not have the ability. It might be another couple minutes before somebody was going to arrive on the scene to deal with that threat. At that point, the first officers that are on scene are gonna proceed into the building to stop that threat. There's active killing, active dying going on, so it needs to be addressed. They may wear regular patrol uniforms. Officer Sullivan's wearing our regular patrol uniform today. Uh, some may have external bulletproof vests, Kevlar helmets, and other tactical equipment to deal with it. Um, some may come in plain clothes as well. So it's important to be able to differentiate if you're used to seeing a patrol officer in a plain uniform, but somebody else might be assisting that officer to stop that threat, might be the first on scene, to be able to differentiate, okay, a badge is normally held here or around the neck. Am I really looking at a police officer? Am I looking at someone who's causing harm to the other people in my building? Officers may be armed with rifles, shotguns, or handguns, so there's different platforms of which they may come in, and depending on what agency. So our backup would be the Springfield Police Department, the Massachusetts State Police Department, and a catastrophic emergency, they're gonna be coming as well. So those radio calls are gonna go out. And a lot of times, I was fortunate initially, unfortunately, a lot of times what, uh, what happens when we find afterwards is everybody self-deploys to these things. So people will hear radio transmissions and they'll know that something's going on at a college and institution and elementary school, and they'll self-deploy resources. And before you know it, if there's not a strong emergency management plan in place, that X, that spot that had the emergency is inundated with all these people and there's no way to keep track. <coughs> Officers may use pepper spray or tear gas to control the situation. And they may shout commands and push individuals to the ground for their safety. <coughs> so it's important, and it's easier said than done obviously, to remain calm and follow officers' instructions. Put down any items in your hands, bags, jackets, cell phones, anything like that. Those officers, while they are trained to deal with a stressful situation, are also entering what could potentially be an active shooter situation. So they need to be able to make quick decisions uh, on what is perceived to be a threat to them and what isn't. Keeping your hands visible at all times is crucial, as well as avoid making quick movements towards police officers, such as holding on to them for safety. So the reason why police officers wear uniforms is so they can be differentiated. It's the instant command presence that they get on the scene. It directs attention towards them. If we're in a catastrophic emergency situation, it's human nature to be drawn to that uniform. But that officer has a job to do. So as that officer first arrives on the scene, their primary focus is going to be to stop the threat to human life. 
Avoid pointing, screaming, or yelling. And do not stop and ask officers for help or direction when evacuating. Proceed from the direction from which officers are entering the premises. So that's like the number one thing. Uh, they don't have time to sit there and differentiate which way are we going here. If an officer came through one entrance, your safest bet is to go back out that way. <clears throat> the police response to an active killing incident is to evaluate the situation. There's gonna be immediate deployment and rapid intervention. They're coming loud, they're coming fierce, they're coming quick. A lot of times, the people that are carrying out these attacks are cowards, we know that. So just the very siren in the distance that police interaction is about to happen will be enough for them to take their own lives. They're gonna to move to the shooter and apply the necessary means to stop the threat. At this point, it turns into a rescue and evacuate situation, and only at this point. And this is a lot of times where I find uh, the hardest for some people to wrap their minds around uh, when they see or you know, debriefs of, of these events. It's important to remember that the first officers to arrive on scene will not stop to help injured persons. You need to expect rescue teams comprised of additional officers and emergency medical personnel to follow those initial officers. The rescue teams will treat and remove any injured persons and they may call upon able-bodied individuals to assist in removing the wounded from the premises. So <clears throat> the alert, again, we're trained on the alert platform. And alert level two, they have instructors that are uh, a part of our staff. That's more medical based, okay? So we've dealt with the initial threat, we've stopped the threat, and now it goes to evacuating the people that are injured, applying tourniquets, again, we start to think about what can be used as a tourniquet to stop, stop the bleed if you are actually hit. So that's where your belt could come into play. Anything that you can use at that point, a t-shirt and just tying off and stopping the bleeding can be the difference in life and death. Ultimately, we hammer home the old adage, if you see something, please say something. Our department is a 24-7 operation and we encourage the campus community to report any and all suspicious behavior, no matter how small it may be. If you observe behavior that makes you think twice, give us a call. We're always open, 24-7, 365. If there's an unattended object, a backpack, a box, an individual who appears to be out of place, odd behavior, pacing, looking through windows, attempting to get into vehicles, if they avoid you when you start to walk towards them to kind of see what's going on with this person. If you overhear a conversation, it's important that you just make sure that you're getting as much detail as you can to us. A lot of times what frustrates our investigators, it's human nature to think, okay, everybody that's on campus belongs to be on campus, so who am I to question somebody walking a certain way? Again, you know your normal routine. You know the people that you see throughout the course of your day. If something makes, we call it in law enforcement, the hair on the back of your neck stand up, pick up the phone and give us a call. It's our job to either say, okay, there's something substantial here that needs to be dealt with, and it's also our job to debunk some, uh, a concern of a patron of our, our college or institution as well. So it's just as important to have that encounter to say, okay, you have a legal reason to be here, you know, you're visiting, you're uh, you know, a patron, you're going to admissions, whatever it may be, it's our job to have that interaction, you know? So just give us a call, no matter what. It makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up if something feels out of place, Make sure our officers are getting over to address it. All right, here's our contact information. So I'm gonna open it up to uh, questions. I'm gonna do a Q&A portion from this point on. I threw a lot of information at you at once. So if you don't already have our contact information, I also have my card up here. I really appreciate you folks coming out to this. If you wanna bring it back to your department heads or uh, professors, anything that you want, we do this in a one-on-one -on -one interaction. If you just give us a place to do it, and we can make sure we'll get set up and we'll take care of that. Um, so we're more than happy to have a little bit more of an intimate interaction with you, with you folks uh, if you want one specific for your department. So that's it, I appreciate your time. So I just talked about killing and dying for the last 45 minutes. So, so I always throw my dog up there last to kind of lighten the mood while we're doing the Q&A. So that's Matt the dog. Thank you everybody.